everybody to another MoTeC webinar. Today's subject is smart things you can do with a GPS and an ECU. And my name's Pete Swinney. Okay, uh, topics for today. We're going to assume that uh, this, the sub, we're going to assume that the vehicles, boats, uh, cars, whatever that you're dealing with, have an ECU only on them and that they, that, that ECU is an M84 or an M, M100 series ECU. So the advantages and features that we're going to talk about assume that you don't have a dash to look at lap times and things like that. So it's for anyone who's got one of those ECUs already and with the addition of a GPS this webinar will tell you about some of the things you can do with that information. Uh, we're going to say why, why a GPS at all and uh, we'll talk about how to wire it to an ECU, how to set it up in the ECU, uh, the channels that you would want to log and we'll explain a little bit about some of the GPS channels. Some of the live uses that you can um, use in the GPS sorry, in the ECU with the GPS, and uh, how to create beacons and creating laps, which is the really large advantage of running uh, the GPS into the ECU, is being able to create laps, do overlays, and assess the data in a highly accurate manner. And finally, we'll show you how to export that uh, global positioning system information into Google Earth. So, all right, so uh, why use a, cheap, a GPS at all? Uh, first reason is that it's actually cheap. And GPS technology and uh, mass sales, I suppose, has meant that we now have 5 hertz at least GPS systems around. MoTeC have um, done a lot of research and are currently using the Garmin 5 hertz GPS and I would suggest that most of the buy prices for that should be between $250 and $300. So it's a relatively cheap uh, sensor, if you like, and gives you a lot of information, as you'll see coming up soon. It's easy to wire. It's, it's three wires, and it's in. Um, a lot of our looms, our marine jet ski looms and so forth, have uh, some of the wiring already there for you, but it's certainly not a difficult task to wire in. Uh, it's relatively accurate. Again, today's technology is better than it used to be where GPSs were very slow to update and had sort of 10 to 20 meter inaccuracies. Um, but today, the, with the, the faster update rates and as more satellites, I think, are allocated to giving us the updates and information and, and offset positions that we need, then accuracies can be down as close as yeah. half a meter or better. Uh, there's quite a science on the relative accuracy and where you are and the, G the satellites used, which we won't go into today, but it's certainly um, good enough for use with, with uh, up to club level motorsport. Uh, it's got a lot of uses as well. Uh, you can use it for speed, we can use it for, for driven lines, and because you have speed, an accurate speed trace now available in the ECU, then that has many, many advantages and uses. So wiring wise, uh, as I say, we're just repeating that the GPS is only suitable into the 100 series ECUs and the new M84. Just one of the reasons for that, it's actually relatively difficult to get uh, later GPS into uh, an ECU. It uses uh, very, very large numbers. The longitude and latitude numbers uh, go down to five decimal places. So uh, it, it takes quite an advanced ECU to read those numbers and be able to process them. Um, we recently, probably in the last year or so, got the 100 series ECUs to do that. And um, the advantage of that is going to be, become quite obvious. So the, certainly the MoTeC GPS, which is really the simplest one to install, has a four-pin Deutz connector on it. And the pinouts as follows, pin one, zero volts, 
and to B15 or B16 of the dual plug connector on the ECU. Uh, pin 2 is the receive, the RX uh, goes into B18. Pin 3 is a programming pin that we use in assembly. And pin 4 is the 5 volt supply for the GPS. I can tell you from sad experience that if you put 12 volts in there, the GPS becomes um, a relatively expensive paperweight. They're not, re not repairable and 12 volts will definitely ruin them. So you need to be careful not to do that. Alright, so assuming you've got it wired correctly, uh, the ECU setup is the next task. First thing we want to look up is the communication setup. So I'll just grab the little arrow here. We start with the adjust menu down to general setup communications and RS232 telemetry setup. The GPS communicates on the protocol called RS232. We don't need to know too much more about it other than that. We go into that setup screen which is in the background here and there's only two things to configure. The first one is the board rate and that's the speed at which the data goes between the two devices. We need to have them talking at the same speed and the speed for the Garmin 5 Hertz from Motec is 19201 and the second parameter is sim simply to turn off the, the telemetry data set which is a feature that we're not using in this case. So we have that at zero and the board rate at 19201 and we're in business, simple as that. Really the only other thing to set up after that is the uh, channels to log. Obviously if we have speed in the ECU we want to log it. That's the whole, the whole point of it. If we don't have a dash we can't see any of this so the only advantage, um, well the most common advantage and the largest advantage is to log it. Now the, the, uh, the first statement we've made here, log this at, at least twice the speed of update. Now the GPS we currently sell is 5 Hertz. That means it gives an update at least five times a second and you would normally log it at twice that speed. Now if you're wanting the ultimate precision in the uh, longitude and latitude lines more so than the speed but e even, even so the faster you log it the more accurate everything will become and, and that's all there is to it. You can log everything at 5 hertz and you'll get reasonable information but if the, if the speed and the direction of your vehicle, boat, jet ski, whatever, is changing very quickly and often, then the slower you log it, the more of those little errors will creep in and you know, it won't be as good as what it can be. The offset of this is there's always a bad side to doing something better and that's that the, uh, the amount of time in the ECU will diminish as you log things faster. So we've got more information about logging and, and ECU um, parameters and things like that in our webinar, other webinars that you can search on our website. However, the basic um, premise is that the ECU has a certain amount of logging and depending on which one you have, it's either half or one meg. And the more, the more things you log and the faster you log them, the less time you actually get. Now when you're online to the ECU, down the bottom of the logging setup screen, it will tell you how many items you've got logged. So here we have a maximum number of logged items at 64. That's all you can log. After that, it doesn't log anymore. You can actually keep adding the items into the logging setup, but it just doesn't log them. So 64 is your maximum. Uh, currently, with the setup that I've given a screen capture to, there are 29 items logged. And the total logging time for this particular setup that I, again, that I got the screen capture from is 1,214 seconds. So uh, if you divide that by 60, I'm doing this on my calculator, you get 20 minutes worth of logging. Now, if you're going out to do a one minute test, what that means is you can bump the logging up on all this stuff. You may want to log your RPM and your lambda and manifold pressure a lot faster. And that way you can get more accurate and defined information. If this is a 40-minute race, then and you want all the data from all the race, 
then you'll need to reduce the logging time or the logging frequency and the number of uh, logged items to get that number there out to around 2,000 or more. Okay, so next. Uh, actually, I'll just go back. I got sidetracked by Mandy not being able to see uh, the screen, but she's all sorted now, which is good. Um, just for those that haven't spent a lot of time in the logging setup, you, the um, menus here on the right-hand side. So we go down to adjust, data logging setup, and then there's a large tree of different uh, items or different sub-menus that you can go in and choose the different channels to log. Now the GPS menu is right at the bottom. It's actually the last uh, sub-menu and the different parameters are, are listed here and this is the close-up of it. I'll just actually quickly go through these before we go on. Um, the, the longitude and latitude actually turns up in the ECU as four channels. So this, uh, where the arrow is now, is GPS latitude high numbers is what I'm going to going to call it, and low, low with high with low. I actually honestly don't know what that stands for right at this minute. But either way, this is the GPS latitude channel, which actually has to be split in two in the ECU for it to process the size of the number. And then the longitude uh, channels are there as well. So you have to, if you want to see the actual trace of where you've been, your driven line, uh, or draw a track map or anything like that, you need to log those four channels. And when you actually look at them in I2, our data analysis software, it, it actually joins them together and just makes them two channels. All right, you can also log the GPS time. Now you'll see I've logged that quite slowly because it's really not critical data for me and it's just kind of useful to know the time and date. Maybe you, you can look at this log file uh, in a year's time and certainly when you download the log itself, you'll get a time and date. But sometimes a log file has consisted of three or four days of testing and it's nice to see, oh, okay, this was at 3.30 in the afternoon on the 2nd of February and I can see that just by logging that GPS real time. So we log our latitudes and longitudes as fast as we can for the time we want to uh, have the logging go for, and obviously our GPS speed as well. So 5 hertz would be okay for a 5 hertz GPS, but as I said before, the, long, more, the faster you log it, the better, the better it is. There are a couple of quality style channels that help with diagnosis, and we don't usually bother logging those. Um, the GPS satellites used is a really good... Um, channel to log and again it's really just to sh help me decide if the speed drops to zero on a particular file is that because we lost GPS reception or is that because the guy fell off the track and stopped um, so if we log the satellites used and the speed drops to zero but I still see satellites there that means that we've got no shadowing or anything like that the system's up and running and um, it's just a quick way of making sure that's that everything's working okay and that the GPS is, is getting the right information. Obviously the more satellites and their actual position in the sky affects the actual, the, the accuracy of the, the information. And it, it's relatively well known that uh, satellites are, more satellites are placed in over the North America region than they are potentially over Tasmania in Australia or in some more obscure regions. So the information and accuracy you get will vary depending on where you are in the world. Okay, so some of the live uses that we can uh, use the GPS information for while riding our jet ski, while in our boat, or while in our car are realistically speed related information is what we can make use of. And the most common use for a GPS today is in marine craft where measuring speed is quite difficult. In the past, people have had to use paddle wheels and pressure sensors, but no, nothing anywhere near the accuracy that the GPS gives us today. So anyone who's got any sort of marine craft, boat, ship, jet ski, whatever, canoe, 
the, the advantage of having the GPS in there is just enormous to, to be able to have accurate speed and distance information. Uh, but similarly, because of its accuracy and ability to create laps, uh, a lot of cars are using it rather than um, purchasing a, well, very accurate but slightly more expensive beacon and transmitter and receiver setup that you would see on a professional racing car. So it's a very cheap way of getting uh, lap information into an ECU or a dash. And uh, our testing even some years ago showed that the accuracy of a correctly set up GPS system for the lap time accuracy was average two hundredths of a second accurate. So uh, definitely, um, definitely, you know, if that's in the ballpark of where you'd like to be for accuracy, then it's uh, a suitable solution for that. So once we have accurate speed into an ECU, we can use it for different things. We can use it for speed limiting. So if you don't have wheel speed sensors and you like the GPS on the dash or up on the roof, you can immediately use that for speed limiting. So you can have a little hidden switch, if you like, on the um, uh, under the dash, and any time you flick it on, it in invokes a speed limiter, and as soon as the, the uh, speed limit setting is exceeded, the GPS, uh, the, sorry, the ECU just uh, provides an RPM limit cut. Um, so good for valet parking and things like that. And you can actually configure the ECU to, if it sees that the speed is zero, in other words, your valet parking guy's uh, blocked the GPS, or he goes into the garage and it gets no output, then you can also uh, have the RPM limit come to a certain, you know, certain predetermined cut level. So um, you can use speed-based boost control. So again, we've used this in the past with our boat customers where they might approach a buoy and go into the turn and uh, certainly a lot of boats with excessive amounts of power when travelling at lower speeds can't often use all the power or the full boost on the engine and so at lower speeds you may choose to drop the boost request in the ECU lower to help prevent cavitation and things like that. And the other thing we can do is, uh, just another example, is we can have speed-based fuel and ignition compensation. So at, at lower speeds, we can choose to either add or subtract ignition timing or fuel for, for uh, numerous reasons. Uh, for launch launching on race racing while the speed is low, the, the, um, you need some more power to get off the line. Uh, there's, there's numerous reasons that you may want to use that. The pictures show some examples of those tables in the ECU. So here's an aim boost table where ground speed provided by GPS is on the vertical axis and RPM on the horizontal. And you can see from the table that the boost request is lower at lower speeds, uh, but at higher RPM it's, it's slightly higher. Obviously the table's there for you to put whatever numbers that you want in. And uh, the fact is that you need you know that you can apply a GPS speed channel onto the side of any axis on any table in a certainly in a hundred series ECU. I will say that the GPS is not ideal for drag racing, and the re the reason for that is that a GPS takes a certain amount of time to get the satellites acquired. It, it's got a, a certain delay. Uh, while it gets moving, if you like, it's not enormous, but uh, I'd suggest it's not good enough for drag racing. So the GPS gives the most accurate information, or the ECU makes the most accurate use of the information when the speed is the highest, and certainly when it's not transitioning. So when you are sitting doing 100 kilometres an hour, that's a good point uh, to do to put a beacon in to do uh, lap times. Uh, it's complicated the reasons, but it's because of the, there's not a great rate of change, and it makes it easier for the hardware to predict a precise uh, point on a map. Um, so when you're starting from zero and accelerating very quickly, like a drag racing uh, vehicle, whether it even be uh, water-based drags or tarmac-based drags. It, it, the EP, EC, 
the GPS information isn't as accurate as um, a steady state uh, point like circuit racing and so forth. As soon as you're doing anything more than 20 to 30 kilometers an hour, it's a relatively accurate, um, uh, you, you can plot more accurate points on, on maps and so forth. All right, so um, an example of the setup for ground speed limiting, you, it's a very simple parameter that you can set up and you just put in the limit um, that you want the ECU to start the limiting at uh, and a couple of other parameters for how you want it to cut and um, randomise and cut types and things like that. And down the bottom is an example of uh, compensation on an ignition uh, an ignition compensation and base, it's a 2D base table and effectively at zero uh, G ground speed and this is a safety factor in this point so if the GPS ever um, dropped out the ground speed would read zero so in this case you'll see from the table that we're actually adding ignition timing so we don't want to have let's say three degrees extra timing at zero ground speed just in case the GPS drops out and that way it would add three degrees of timing. So in this case, as soon as the ground speed starts reading, it's, it phases in ignition timing and for the first, uh, if this was potentially some sort of a launch on a jet ski or something like that, for the first up to 100 kilometres an hour, it's adding ignition timing for that short period of time to get the, the vehicle off the line and then after it's reached 160 kilometres an hour, in this particular case, the timing's all gone. And at that point, potentially the engine's a lot hotter, may not stand that extra timing. So it's just a number of ways you can use it in the ECU live to help you. Okay, creating beacons. This, this is uh, one of the more useful features of having this GPS in your data. And this is a new, a new feature, and even people with GPSs and dashes uh, can use this feature. So the example I've shown you here is actually from a jet sprint boat. And we can configure I2 to basically plot the raw GPS track. Now, this isn't an official, mo what you would call a MoTeC track map. It's a... And add just a raw plot of the path that the GPS it itself took. And in this case, you can see that uh, the, it is a jet sprint uh, track where the small boats tear around islands uh, in quite a confined area. And one of the big uses now with GPS on board is we can actually plot a start and end point and divide the data up into laps. Uh, that way, in, the data engineers can quickly overlay the laps and look at differences from, from one run to the next. Now, we've always been able to overlay data, but being able to have them quickly aligned to an exact point is, uh, is, is a big advantage, and it allows the data analysis to happen much faster. So in, in an example like this, as I said earlier, we really don't want to pick a beacon point at much less than 30 kilometres an hour. So we open the data and that's what we see in front of us here and we're going to place the cursor at a point above 30 kilometers an hour and this is going to be our new beacon start point now that's uh, all you have to do at this point the next thing you want to do is go to the lap editor up here at the top picture of a couple of uh start flags if you like a green and red flag and that will open the lap editor screen and in the lap editor screen you'll see uh, you can manually insert a beacon point you can remove them you can restore them you can auto insert them by distance or we can auto insert by gps and that's what we want to do today so effectively wherever you put that cursor is going to be the new beacon point and all you do is click that button you don't have to copy all along and let uh, numbers into your dash manager or anything like that this is just simply a matter of looking at the data clicking the point you want to be the new beacon point and it auto inserts the beacon at that at that ex exact place 
Now, you'll see the actual latitude and longitude come up here in I2, uh, the auto insert screen, and then it will ask you about the tolerance. Now, it's useful to understand what this means because sometimes you're going to want different numbers in here. Uh, now, I've got a screen that kind of explains that in a little more detail. So, in the picture here, we have a, a boat uh, with a GPS on it. And the GPS, the, the I2 or analysis, basically that makes this imaginary line running perpendicular to the GPS. So that's represented by this yellow line here. Now, if you've gone in and, and put a point in the data at a particular long and lap point, and in this example, that's the red dot. So that's a particular longitude and latitude. Now, even on a, on a circuit racing scenario, you're never going to be going, putting the car uh, or in the water, the boat, on that exact point. So you need a certain area of tolerance. So if the vehicle comes within a circle or a, a radius area of the actual precise longitude and latitude, the beacon mark will be recognized. So it'll actually click it as a lap, if you like. So each time the boat comes round in this case, all the boat has to do is be within the tolerance. Now, when you say a 10 meter tolerance, that means a 10 meter radius from the red dot to here. So that's a 20 meter distance from one side to the other. The diameter is 20 meters. So you've just got to come within 10 meters of the dot and the lap time will be recognized or the beacon point will be recognized. So, but because of this, this large tolerance, it doesn't actually mean it'll be inaccurate because you can see that the actual triggering point is this perpendicular line that runs out the side of the actual GPS unit itself. So um, each of these yellow dots here represents a logging point and the I2 is able to calculate precisely when you get to the red dot based on the speed that the uh, boat or the GPS is traveling at and the known logged points, and it's very accurate with how it calculates it. But as you can see, if you're transitioning in your speed, then the calculation can't, isn't as precise. So if you're doing, um, if you're placing a single point in order to do lap times at a circuit, then that point is better placed at, you know, in the middle of the straight where the speed is relatively steady. That's the most accurate place you can load a point. So if this boat was doing laps around boys, then we might have one boy here and another boy maybe there where the green arrow is now. So the boat is actually going, has accelerated and is going at a relatively steady speed compared to as if it were just coming out of the boy area. So that's where you would place your marker. Now back in our example, of course, we uh, we're doing this at a jet sprint track. So we, we want to put it at us at the beginning of a of a lap so we don't get much choice we just want to place it as soon as we can as soon as the as the uh, boat is above 30 kilometers per hour okay all right so in the case of the uh, jet sprint boat or a rally car or anything that has a start and stop point we need to define the end point as well uh, and this will help show you why you need toler the tolerance circle. So we are going to put an end point in the data and it will simply mark uh, a second beacon. And you can see we've placed the cursor here. Here it is on the little uh, track map. And it's at a point where it's not affected by other transitions around this, this particular island that's in the middle. If I put the start fin the start point here in the data, because at this particular track I happen to know that the boat it goes around here and then finishes, and the actual the finish line is officially at this point here. The problem with that is that there's another part of the of the track where the boat comes around and goes around this direction, and that would trigger a lap beacon. So we don't want multiple beacons in there. Uh, we we'll just divide it up into too many laps. And so what happens is we need to move the finish point away from where the boat is running in its normal race. 
And similarly, if the star point which we placed here, we had two larger tolerance circles, so in other words, it was a large circle way out here, then what that would mean is as the boat came around this corner, it would trigger the start point. So if our start point is going to be close to some other parts of the track that the car or boat are running on, we need to reduce the tolerance circle down. That said, it needs to be big enough to be able to, to trigger off the different variations that the GPS will give you across a day because the GPS actual longitude and latitudes will, will phase shift over, over time um, as satellites drift and the, you get a small amount of drift, drift happening. So you do need a certain tolerance. So start with it as large as you can uh, to make sure that you, but not getting affected by other parts of the of the track when the boat or car are racing. I'll show you another example of when you have to be careful later on a on a racing car track. All right. So if we get at a successful start uh, point and a successful end point, the data gets split up into laps. So if you have one uh, one log file with ten laps in it. You simply put in those that start and stop point, and then that log file just gets automatically split up into ten proper laps. And all the idling and and mucking around and start pools and and the pit garage and and everywhere else is all eliminated, and you just have genuine laps that you can overlay. So this is an example of a car at a circuit. Um, you can, if you're used to looking at uh, circuit-based data, you can see that some of these uh, RPM traces are repeating, which means it's going around laps. But the vehicle has no wheel speed, no genuine wheel speed trace, and no G sensor, and no uh, official lap beacon. But it did have a GPS. So with the GPS, simply installed a beacon point in the data, as we showed you before. And effectively, that's what happens. The laps just get uh, put in, and you've got an out lap in this case, and lap one, lap two, lap three, lap four, and an in lap. So just by putting by putting one point in the data, you get all your data split up into laps. Uh, so you can do this after the fact, and then overlay laps to have a look at driving improvements and so forth. Another use for an accurate speed trace, and again, this example is from a jet ski, but any, any car like a hill climb car or anything like that where you want to look at acceleration, um, because the, in this particular case we have a rolling start, then the GPS is relatively accurate, but you, you, again, you could use it for uh, a standing start. Just that first little bit of data is not necessarily going to be dead accurate. So in this case, we have a rolling start from an idle, and you can see here that this, uh, both these uh, files that have been overlaid were doing five mile an hour at the, at the point of acceleration. So the colored lines, red and green, nice simple uh, overlay here for you, are from the original file or the main file. And the black lines are from an overlaid um, example. So. This could be from another vehicle. It could be after some tuning has been done, some, maybe some, some prop testing, some, some different tyres. It, it could be anything. The idea is to simply overlay the two pieces of information and see where the real gains are. Now, in this exact example, it is a GPS uh, data from a jet ski. And we can see here, if we go to the end of the data and we have a look, I can see that the black trace on this particular uh, boat, if you like, is much faster. So the overlaid data is faster. I can see it's pulling more RPM and certainly the speed is up. Yet uh, at the beginning, uh, at this point here, when the RPM is identical between both traces, and if we overlay the throttle trace, uh, that we would normally line it up based on the throttle trace. The two throttle positions were identical. Yet at this point here, you can see the black line is much slower than the green line or the original lap or the original um, test. Now the data or the cursor at this point shows us 
the actual information at the point of the cursor, so our original file is 38.3 miles per hour. The overlaid line, the black line, is 33.9 miles per hour, and the delta, or the difference between the two, is 4.5 mile an hour. So if someone was to use a handheld GPS, for instance, on this, they would find that this particular setup was faster. However, when you look at it closely, you can see that certainly until it gets to this point on the data, it's much slower. And we can look at the actual reason for that, and the reason for that, in this, again, in this particular case, is cavitation. It's actually hit the RPM limit here. ECUs uh, clipped the power because of the RPM limit. And at that point, the engine's uh, power is reduced, and the, the file where the RPM limit has not been hit uh, is much faster, and that's the reason for the gain. So you couldn't, you could have no idea of what really happened unless you had reasonably accurate speed traces to, to overlay and draw those conclusions from. And it's using that speed in this manner Allow, that allows you to, to measure the gains and losses in your data. And, and that's how you make progress with using data. In order to make forward progress, we need to see when we've made a loss or, and or when we've made a gain. And we simply take that information and continue to make changes. So that, that, and that's huge. It's a simple GPS and that information is there. All right, uh, to finish with today, we're going to show you a neat little feature uh, called Google Earth Export. Now, uh, you can take any data in your, um, in your I2 that's been supplied from an ECU with GPS. So virtually any GPS data that has longitude and latitude lines. I'll just quickly go back and show you an example of those. Here they are here. And this is how we know that the GPS is working well. We bring up the channels GPS latitude and GPS longitude. And you need them in separate panels because they're uh, markedly different numbers. See, this one's minus 34 point whatever. And this one's 147 point 5166755. So, so these are the raw longitude and latitude lines. And this is what the GPS uses to mark its beacons, draw the tracks and things like that. And it's this information, this is real longitude and latitude, uh, so this information can be plotted uh, using Google Earth. Just race back up there. So, basically get a lap up uh, that you've created with your beacons, and then go up to the main menu, so go File, Google Earth Export, and in this case, we have some data from a racetrack in Sepang, and I'm going to call this uh, Sepang L1 for lap one. So we save that, and that automatically opens Google Earth, and you get that familiar globe turning up. And that will, uh, if everything is, all the information is correct and everything's working, the Google Earth will open up, and you will get a screen like that. So, in this particular case, you can see a picture of the racetrack Sepang, and we can actually manipulate the long and latitude line itself. So, this line that's drawn on the overlaid on the track here is the line taken by this particular race car. And because I'm actually going to show you that you can overlay these, we can change the color and width of the line. Now to do that, when you uh, are in Google Earth, the file that we called Sepang L1, and it's going to be hard for you to read there, is um, it's called a KML file. And if you right click on it and go to the properties, you'll see in there that you can change the thickness and color of the line. Now I've made it quite thick so you can see it on your screens. Um, but this allows us to overlay other laps and change the colors and thickness of those lines. Now this is the example I wanted to show you where if we had a beacon point placed at this point here and we had a 20 meter tolerance for instance and that was only 10 meters from this point to this part of the track then not only would we get a beacon point as the car went down the main straight here when the car went round the back here or actually in this direction 
it would also clip that beacon. So we can either choose to put our beacon point here where there's no other parts of the track, or if we do put it here, then really the torrent only needs to be a little wider than the track width itself, give or take maybe a couple of metres. And some of this, unfortunately, is trial and error. And some, some places where satellites aren't as frequent and, and aren't as, as many of them in the sky, then you sometimes have to have larger tolerance circles. So it'll be something you experiment with. So anyway, our data can be overlaid. Um, maybe you're uh, doing this out at sea or you're doing it uh, on a river or something somewhere. Uh, you can even run the full length of a river and download the data and see where you went on Google Earth. The nice part about it is, is that you can actually select a second lap. So here you'll see we're on lap two. Again, go up to the uh, export um, menu, up on file, export data into Google Earth. Save this particular KML file as L2 for lap two. And then change it to a different color using the uh, properties within the KML file. And in this case, I've changed the second lap to green. And you will see now the two laps are physically overlaid and you can see the different driving lines that the, the driver has taken and maybe explain some of the faster or slower corners or times um, based on the actual driven lines. And this screen, next screen here, I've given zoomed in on this data and you can see here that it's uh, absolutely two dramatically different points on the track that this particular driver has taken at this venue. Now, there, again, I, I have to say that depending on satellites and, and, and place on the globe will depend on the accuracy of this, but I would suggest to you that that's relatively accurate. The, the drivers are all going to be going on this outside end, outside uh, part of the track here, given choice, and the, these two lines are completely overlaid at that point, so I'd suggest this data is, uh, you could hang your hat on it if you like. Alright, that's it really. Uh, thanks for attending. There's a lot more information on creating track maps and things like that in our other webinars uh, that are on our website. Of course, you can view them at any time. Um, and that the ability to create all a full, a, a full um, track map, a proper MoTeC-based track map with section times, rainbow track mapping of, of different data, um, uh, lap gain loss, a lot of that type of stuff, variance is the, the, the processes for doing that can be found in different webinars on our website. Uh, so we, we didn't cover that today. Um, but if you take that information, if you get your GPS into your ECU and, and get those laps formed, then that's the hard part uh, from there, learning how to create track maps and so forth, just a matter of watching those webinars. So thanks for attending and we'll catch you next time.